Hi folks, uh, we're live on Facebook at the Premier's office and I'm joined by Dr. Dina Hinshaw, who is the Chief Medical Officer of Health for Alberta. Uh, Dina, how long have you been in that job? So just over a year. I started the job a year ago in January. And so you are you were just telling me you're a third generation Albertan and you did your studies in public health here in Alberta? Yes, at the um, U of A. I did my medical school and residency here. And so I imagine you spent your whole professional life reading about uh, pandemic management, public health challenges. Did you ever think you would end up having to coordinate the response of the largest pandemic challenge since uh, over a century? Uh, no, I, I did not imagine that. And so how are you coping, first of all, with all this pressure? Well, I would say that the best thing is that I have an amazing team that I work with. Yeah. So both at the Ministry of Health and also at Alberta Health Services, uh, there's just tremendous people and so this this response only works because of the many many people who are putting long hours in absolutely and so i'm i'm so grateful for that amazing team and great credit to them uh, so folks this is going to be a facebook live session i think we're up for about an hour so if you have questions for dr hinshaw uh, in terms of the public health aspects of alberta's response to the coronavirus or questions about the government response more generally for example to the economic challenges we're facing please just type those out in the comment section below. Obviously, we won't be able to get to all of the questions, but we'll try to, uh, our team here will choose a, a sample of them. We'll get to as many as we can. Uh, before we go there, Dina, or doctor, um, let me ask you a couple of things I'm so impressed by. First of all, Alberta is testing at a higher uh, rate per capita than just about anywhere in the world, with the exception of, I think, South Korea. Uh, we're doing over 2,000 tests a day and I was speaking to the other premiers earlier, they're all frankly envious of how well Alberta is doing. What led to that high level of testing for COVID-19? So one of the advantages we have in Alberta, our provincial lab for public health, uh, which is in the Alberta Precision Laboratories, they have an amazing setup and they work very hard to have cutting edge technology that enables us to respond quickly. So for example, when we had an Ebola outbreak in West Africa, they were able to do local testing. And this is another example. So when this outbreak started in China and testing became available in Canada, our lab was one that got the testing kits from the national lab and built some local capacity. And then they've just really reached out to colleagues locally, so they worked with universities, uh, because one of the things that they're doing is they're running their testing 24-7. So they have people who they cross-trained to come in so that their equipment doesn't sit idle. And, and they just, I can't say enough about the work yeah. of the lab and how amazing they've been. Well, please pass on the gratitude of all Albertans for what they are doing and really mm -hmm. leading the world in, in that way. Another great innovation is the AHS uh, online assessment tool uh, that was launched about a week ago. And I think over 1.2 million Albertans have already used it, which is remarkable. Um, do you know how that was developed? Uh, so I don't have the inside story on that, but I, I do know again that it was an Alberta Health Services product. Uh, and again, I think it's an example of what we can achieve with an organization that's provincial in scope. So we pool right. the resources and are able to then move forward on cutting edge things like this to help Albertans do that online assessment and get some real time feedback and determine whether or not the health link call is something that they need to do. So one of the things I pointed out when we first, I think most Albertans really started to pay attention to the COVID-19 challenge here um, 10 or days or 14 days ago, it all seems like a blur now. I pointed out that um, we have some natural strengths to cope with this in Alberta. First of all, uh, we've had a pandemic plan since 2014 and I understand there was a strong exercise of that back in November. Mm -hmm. And secondly, we have a, a unified single provincial health administration and that's a big advantage as well. Yes, absolutely. And, and also in recent years, we've had the um, four fires, wildfires and floods, which has uh, caused a strong degree of interagency and intergovernmental cooperation. And I think that's proving helpful now as well. Yes, absolutely. I would agree that all of those are foundations that are helping us respond now in the way that we are. Absolutely. So, uh, Doctor, just a couple of other questions before we go to the public questions here. Um, one of which is, uh, what, when, do you see, when do you see, everybody talks about the peak of the infection and trying to flatten the curve. What do those things mean and when do you see that peak potentially happening here in Alberta? So, uh, the Talking about the peak in terms of what that means, usually when there's an infectious disease, 
uh, you start just with a few people and then as those people spread to others it starts to grow exponentially so you see a steep rise in the curve if nothing is done to stop that spread you see the number of people infected go up quite quickly and then at the peak that's typically the point at which uh, you reach kind of the, the saturation in a way and you start to see that come down so every year we see that with influenza every year we see mm -hmm. seasonal influenza come in it starts to rise it goes up to a peak and then comes down and this again. is somewhat weather related too so uh, what we think, and again, this is a new virus, so we'll, we'll be watching closely. We know that influenza we tend to see more of in the winter months. Part of that is the virus actually can survive longer on surfaces in drier, cooler uh, temperatures. And we also spend a lot more time indoors. And so both of those factors combined mean that influenza we tend to see in winter, not so much in summer. And that could be something we see with the coronavirus as well. And that's something we'll have to, to pay attention yeah. to. I just want to speak a little bit to the flattening of the curve that you Please. mentioned uh, because essentially we what we need to do is if we let that growth rise unchecked to that peak and we have the number of people who are all sick at the same time our system will not have the capacity especially because about 15 percent of people who get this virus do need hospital care and about five percent need icu care so if we if we just let that peak rise very steeply then the total number of people who need care all at the same time will overwhelm the system. And so all of the measures that we're putting in place, what we're trying to do is slow the rise and so that the peak is spread out over a longer period of time so that our system has the capacity to care for the people in that top 20% who need mm -hmm. either hospital or critical care so that that group of people is spread out over a longer period of time to have a flatter curve and then again, what we expect, and, and this is all uh, based on what we know of other viruses, we do expect that we would see that to start coming down more towards the summer if this behaves like other respiratory viruses. We could see a second peak in the fall potentially, uh, but those are the things that we're going to be watching very closely. And we did see a second peak 102 years ago with the Spanish flu. That's correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll go to questions now from uh, folks who are uh, watching. First is from Borbs Chris, who asks, is this virus airborne? So what we know about this virus, there's lots of different individual publications out there, but one of the things that is important when we're setting our policy is that we're looking at the collection of all of the best evidence. And we know from the World Health Organization independent mission to China, uh, where they looked at tens of thousands of cases in China at that point in time in uh, late February, that was obviously the place in the world that had the most experience with this. They concluded definitively that the virus is spread through contact with surfaces that have droplets on them or droplets spread through when you're within a couple of meters of a person, especially someone who's coughing, sneezing, talking, uh, that it can spread that way. But very clearly in the evidence that they gathered, this was not airborne over long distances and times, such as measles, for example. The one exception is that when certain medical procedures are being done, that can cause the virus to be spread a little bit more further afield. And so in certain medical settings, uh, there are precautions that need to be taken with, against airborne spread. Uh, but again, the report was very clear, looking at tens of thousands of cases, mm -hmm. that this virus is spread through that close contact and contact within two meters and through surfaces that have been contaminated. So Jennifer Wu has a related question. She asks how long, uh, sorry, somebody else asked about the airborne, but mm -hmm. Jennifer's asking how long do you think the outbreak will last? So that's a difficult question to predict. I think one of the factors that we need to be mindful of is the, the work that's ongoing to produce a vaccine. Uh, we know that vaccine production for a new virus can take a long time, up to a year uh, or even 18 months. If, if vaccine production can be accelerated, then that will help us. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what, what I said earlier about we expect to see a peak now and then potentially a second peak in the fall if this virus behaves like other respiratory right. viruses that we're familiar with. So I expect that we'll see our first outbreak and then we may see a second outbreak later on. Uh, Jake Curley asks, what are the chances of you having the virus but not having symptoms? So again, I'll reference that World Health Organization independent report. Uh, and so again, they looked at tens of thousands of cases and what they determined is that sometimes if someone is tested and they can show uh, a positive swab for the virus, 
uh, those people go on to develop symptoms later. Okay. And it's really what they concluded is that there's this question about asymptomatic transmission. So can someone who has the virus, who has no symptoms, be walking around spreading it to others? And what they concluded, again, this is looking at, at many, many cases, is that uh, it potentially can happen on occasion, but it is not a major driver of spread of this virus. And another fact from that report that I think is quite um, illustrative is the fact that when they looked at people living in the same household, uh, the attack rate was only about 10%. So if you had a confirmed case, the other people living in the same mm. household as that person, it's only about 10% of those wow. people who had it. And later on, as they moved through their outbreak management, they started taking people who had confirmed cases and they would put them in a different um, facility from their household and then it dropped to 3%. So I think those facts to me indicate that if this virus was airborne and easily transmissible before symptoms, the people who lived in the same house, you would see much higher attack rates. Interesting. Now, by the way, one thing I've learned through all of this in the past couple of weeks is that most people were infected, I believe, with H1N1 and they most probably didn't know it. So it's quite, um, ultimately, until there's a vaccine, a lot of people will be infected, but probably not be aware of it, only, only have minor symptoms. Is that correct? So most people who get this virus do have fairly mild symptoms. So about 80% of those who are infected, again, will likely have some symptoms, uh, but it could be minor. It could be you know, a couple of days of fever, perhaps a cough, a sore throat, those kinds of symptoms. The challenge this virus causes is actually exactly because so many people have right. mild symptoms. It, it transmits. Really. It transmits because people who don't feel that right. ill are typically going to be out and about. Which is why your top advice it. is what? Stay home when you're feeling sick, even if it's mild. Please that folks. is absolutely important, yes. Yeah. Next question goes to Derek Walsh, who says, do we expect to see greater restrictions on social gathering and workplaces? So what we're anticipating is that the measures we've put in place will help to slow the spread of the virus. We continue to watch our data, we're monitoring, obviously as uh, you said, Premier, we're testing a large number of people, and so if it seems like we are seeing community spread, we may need to consider some additional restrictions. Again, those would be recommendations if I believe they were necessary that I would take to the Emergency Management Committee of Cabinet to have that discussion. Uh, so we are balancing the need to control the spread of the virus with the recognition that the important piece about moving forward is that we don't completely shut everything down, right. uh, but that we do continue in a safe way to have certain settings that continue to be open uh, so people can still attend, for example, restaurants as long as they're two meters apart, as long as they're not sick. Again, people who are sick should be staying home, even if it's mild. But if that's not the case, then there are places people can attend. I think that's important to emphasize uh, because some people have been, I think, inferred that everyone, the whole population should stay at home and self-quarantine and basically nobody should go to work. I heard a story today, doctor, about um, a bakery that continued to operate with all of the, all of the good sanitation protocols, but uh, they were starting to be harassed by people online saying that they were jeopardizing public health. So I think it's an opportunity for us to say, to follow the, the medical advice, the, the protocols, and which mean um, if you're feeling ill, stay at home for 14 days. If you've come back from abroad, stay at home for 14 days. Obviously, do the self-assessment tool. If you're feeling ill, call 811. But this is not advice from the government or Alberta Health to, for everybody to stay at home. Let, let's just develop that a bit. Sure, yeah, and I think there's, there's a couple of pieces to that. So one of the pieces is that uh, there's also, well, I've been saying stay at home a lot. Uh, but even if someone is, for example, let's say they've come home from traveling from outside of Canada and they're following that self-isolation for 14 days, even though they need to stay away from others, stay at home, that staying at home can include walks outside. As long as they're two meters away from people, actually being outside in the fresh air and sunlight <laughs> is not a danger to others. What was the story you told me about Nova Scotia? So, well. I, I, I will just say that a colleague did share that uh, it, there was someone who'd called the police because a neighbor was on their back deck. And, and so I think that reflects the fear though, yeah. honestly. Like I think it's, it's easy to, um, 
uh, kind of point fingers in a way, but I, but I think that it really reflects the deep fear that people have about the virus. And yeah. so we need to strike that balance of knowing that we need to take this very seriously. Okay. We need to take actions to protect our neighbors and we need to support our neighbors right. and recognize that we're all in this together. And in a way, the anxiety is a good thing because it, it's an elevated level of awareness that people need to, to uh, follow the public health direction. Uh, but it does not mean that everybody has to leave work and, and stay at home. It's, it, and so just if you're not clear on what those directions are, I'll ask our team to please enter into the comment section below a link to the Alberta Health Services COVID-19 page. And there's frequently asked questions. There's lots of information there. Um, all right, next question goes to Den Denita McGuinness, who says, what about workers from all over Canada working in camps in Northern Alberta? So we've certainly had questions about work camps and work camp safety. Uh, and I know that our team has been working on guidelines for work camps. I think one of the important things about any place where people are living in close quarters like that is that those camps have really good protocols for making sure that they're checking symptoms. If anyone is ill, that they're staying away from others and that they're doing things like uh, ensuring that, these, for example, in the cafeterias, people are sitting at distances apart from each other, there's hand sanitizer. Uh, and so I think, again, one of these balancing pieces is that we need to work with the industries that are continuing to operate mm -hmm. to make sure they're doing so safely and to make sure that we're all uh, balancing, again, the fact that there are some businesses that can continue to operate safely and, and, and frankly, time. some that must. We have essential services that need to continue. And so it's a matter, again, of, of working together to make sure those that continue to operate are doing so in a way that uh, reduces the risk or eliminates the risk, if possible, of spreading the virus. And, uh, you know, folks, while well, Dr. Hinshaw and her team are leading the public health response, there are broader implications for this, a pandemic of this nature. So uh, some of those, the broader all government uh, management are being led by the Alberta Emergency Management Agency under the direction of Deputy Minister for Municipal Affairs, um, Paul Winnick, who's the former commander of the Canadian Army, and Shane Schreiber, who's the executive director of that agency. One of their tasks is to keep an eye on uh, essential industries and make sure they're able to continue to function. I'll give you an example. Um, a couple of, uh, it's, I was going to say a couple of weeks ago, it was a few days ago, uh, Dr. Hinshaw's advice was if you're coming in from uh, outside of Canada, self-isolate for 14 days. Well, very quickly, the Trucking Association contacted us and said, hold on, are you saying all of our truckers should go home for 14 days? Well, if that were to happen, very quickly, we actually would have a scarcity of groceries. To be clear, we don't now. But that's an example of a, an, of a vital industry. Or the work camps up north, they, they can't abandon those operations because they would we would lose a, a enormous strategic assets that are essential for our economy. So public health, Dr. Hinshaw, the emergency management agency, the whole of government and the private sector, we're all trying to work together to make, frankly, common sense decisions about these things. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate your, your work with, with everyone on that. Next question goes to Sean Fuller. People, uh, just to finish that story, by the way, Dr. Hinshaw issued a, an exemption from the 14-day requirement for truckers returning back to Canada as long as they closely monitor their health, right? Right, with those additional measures in place that they're working with either their employer or if they're self-employed, that they have that information, not just on monitoring, but also how to keep themselves safe because we want our truckers to not get sick. So making sure that they know the things they can do to protect themselves if they are driving outside of Canada. Uh, so all of those pieces were a part of that exemption. And by the way, let me just say another word about that. Uh, we've seen some really sad examples of so-called panic buying and hoarding going on at our grocery stores. Um, folks, this is frankly ridiculous. I can assure you we've spoken to all of the major grocery chains, uh, the trucking uh, companies. We do not have a shortage of supplies or of food. We have enough supplies and food uh, for the future. Uh, and when you engage in that kind of panic buying, all you're doing is making life even more difficult for the elderly and the vulnerable who, who um, you know, are, are least prepared to, uh, to go into a, an ag aggressive shopping environment. So thank you to the grocery stores that are doing golden hours in the morning. I'll be going to um, one of those stores tomorrow just to thank the management. But please be considerate of your uh, neighbors and, and there's no need for hoarding. All right, next question goes to Sean Fuller. People won't stay home until they are confident they can financially afford to do so. 
is there for more financial relief coming? So I'll take that question. Sean, thank you very much. First of all, the government of Canada announced yesterday uh, a whole, well, I'll, I'll say with what the government of Alberta has done, we are launching an emergency financial assistance program for people who have to go into self-isolation at home and who have no other source of income. People will be able to apply online at uh, alberta.ca next week. Uh, the pay payment should be done quite quickly. The payments will be uh, $573 for two weeks, so about $1,100, $1,140, which is the equivalent to what employment insurance would pay. Uh, now, you'll have to attest that you don't have another source of income. So this is not for people who might be on income assistance, age, um, or they might have retirement income. If those folks have to stay home, they already have an income. This is for folks who fall between the cracks, and that's an emergency payment. Then in April, the federal government will be introducing a version of that, that kind of program, as well as a significant expansion of employment insurance benefits, including for the self-employed and other folks who would not normally qualify for employment insurance. We as a province are looking at whether there are gaps in what the Government of Canada announced yesterday. So, Sean, the answer to your question is that as of early next week, you'll be able to apply for an emergency payment from Alberta if you need to give up income in order to stay at home. Stay tuned for the application form and for details. Next question goes to Cassie uh, Tugnet, and she asks, how does this virus affect asthmatics? What precautions do asthmatics need to take? Should they self-isolate? So uh, we know that people who have asthma or other chronic lung conditions can have more severe disease with respiratory viruses in general, uh, and that is potentially the case with COVID-19. So I think the precautions that I would recommend really would be the same ones that I would recommend for anyone in terms of making sure that you're washing your hands regularly, not touching your face with unwashed hands. Uh, certainly the question about whether or not someone with asthma should just stay home and not go out at all. Uh, I think again, back to my point about making sure that people take time outside in the fresh air. Uh, I'm hoping that the weather will start to warm up, that spring will actually arrive, even though it was minus 15 this morning. <laughs> but uh, as the weather starts <laughs> to get nicer, uh, it's really important for people to, re to know that they can go outside safely. Uh, and with respect to then whether or not someone with asthma should perhaps stay home and not shop or not go out at all, uh, I think again, I would have the same recommendations as to anyone who is at higher risk for possibly having complications. Uh, so maybe trying to go, if you need to grocery shop, at times when there's less people in the stores, making sure that you're cleaning your hands before and after leaving regularly if you're, as you're shopping, just considering having hand sanitizer with you. Uh, and if you do see someone who's ill, uh, staying at least two meters away from them. And also just in general social distancing, so trying to stay about two meters away from others as you're out in public. Uh, so I think, again, those would be my general recommendations. And I think anyone who has a chronic condition or who's elderly would want to consider those ways that they can keep themselves safe. Thanks, Doctor. And just for folks who have joined us recently, this is a Facebook Live opportunity to ask questions. You can just enter them in the comments section. If you'd like to share this with friends, you can do a watch party or just share it. Um, if you have questions on health issues, please ask, ask Dr. Hinshaw, and I'll, and, uh, but I'm also here to take questions about more general government support for people during this challenging time, it, because of, as everybody knows, the uh, pandemic itself has created a global economic downturn, which is affecting us here in Alberta and all of the, the businesses that have had to, to close temporarily, in addition to which, of course, we have a, a very challenging collapse in energy prices. So there are many challenges that we're managing simultaneously. The next question goes to Alana Grant and she says, what's the government doing about hair salons? We are unable to keep the recommended social distancing and will the government do a mandatory closure for salons? So I would answer this question. I think we had an earlier question about will there be full business shutdown of non-essential services? Uh, so I would say at the moment, that's not where we're at right now. We continue to watch the situation to see if our situation changes and whether or not we may need to take additional measures, which again uh, would be the decision of the Emergency Management Cabinet Committee. Uh, what I would say about hair salons and any other service where people are going to receive a particular service in kind of a one-on-one -on -one environment 
is that it may be prudent to be asking clients uh, whether or not they have symptoms. If they do, encourage them to rebook. Uh, the staff, same thing. Anyone who's ill should not be at work, should not be there. And then with respect to social distancing, while it's not possible to be two meters apart from someone in order to, to do their hair, uh, you can make sure that there are perhaps distancing measures in waiting rooms, uh, trying to make sure that, that people as they're waiting or, or maybe in the chairs uh, are, are seated apart from each other or facing in the opposite direction. So there are some of those things that you can do over and above uh, what you maybe typically do in a hair salon. Uh, but at this time, again, we have not recommended that those kinds of individual services to people close. Uh, people may be wondering, what's the process for these decisions to be made? So just to share that with you, because we want to be fully transparent with the public, uh, Dr. Hinshaw and her team um, are obviously monitoring all of this very carefully and they've obviously wanted to increase the uh, the basically the practices for social distancing to contain the spread of the virus without completely shutting down our entire society and our entire economy and so uh, Dr. Hinshaw comes to our uh, emergency management committee of the provincial cabinet uh, with recommendations um, at, that we discuss and you know, the, folks, none of these are easy, easy clear-cut decisions because for every decision there is a cost. And, um, and, and think about it, for example, um, a seniors becoming completely isolated in their seniors' residences um, is ultimately not a great thing for their, for their mental health. And that can have physical, physiological con implications as well. You know, people losing their jobs has health implications. So, you know, doctor, I, I saw you quoted the other day saying that we're having to make decisions between people's lives and livelihoods. I think we need to share with folks that, that, that this is not some, always some clear-cut decision. There's a balance, there's a tension here. Yes, absolutely. And, and those exactly are the tensions that we hold when making recommendations because our pandemic plan very clearly states our objectives in responding to a pandemic are to protect the health, to prevent spread of the disease, and to minimize as much as possible disruption on society. And so we don't take any of these recommendations like, lightly that uh, we make from public health. Um, and you know, the decisions, And neither does again, the cabinet no, committee no, consider that. Are, are very, they're weighed very closely. So I think that's exactly, that's exactly right. Some people might, I, I think some of these folks who, who think, you know, why are you going out on the back porch if you're in self-isolation? I think some people wonder, why aren't we doing what Italy has done and just shutting everybody down 100% quarantine? Mm -hmm. So I think what we've seen in Italy uh, is that they waited a little bit longer to implement uh, essentially any social distancing measures. And I'm also not sure what, what I understand, and I will say that uh, the volume of information that's coming and the speed with which things yeah. change. It's hard to keep uh, up. My understanding is that they didn't have the same kind of testing volume or testing of, of incoming people. So I think that they may have been a little bit behind when they started to put their measures in. And our hope is, as we put our measures in, that we are early enough in our potential spread that we can start to flatten the curve and we'll see again, we'll monitor and, and we don't know what we may need to do. Uh, but I think there's a misconception that if we just shut everything down for two weeks, then we could all go back to business as usual after those two weeks are over. And that's simply not the case. So uh, again, I think some people may be saying, well, why aren't you just more aggressive all at once mm -hmm. or for a shorter time? Uh, but it just doesn't work that way. This virus, again, no one in the population has immunity, so it will continue to slowly spread. And another issue here, mm -hmm. I think we need to be transparent with folks about, is the potential duration of all of this. Yes. And, and so please understand, when we're balanced, when we are considering Dr. Hinshaw's recommendations, when she's considering what to recommend in terms of social distancing, we also have to keep in mind, this is not just for two weeks, folks. Folks, I mean, we, we're talking per perhaps at, at, at a minimum of several weeks, and, 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 and cer certain measures could have to last longer than that. And, and we've got to consider how likely are people to comply with some of these rules if they go on for two or three or four months? At, at what point do, do people become a bit stir crazy? So those are the kind of things we also have to consider is the, is the durability of some of these protocols. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you, and, and we'll now go to Kate Alyssa, who says, how many ventilators are in Alberta? So I don't have the total number of ventilators 
that Alberta Health Services has. I know that they did order 50 extra ventilators very early on to make sure they had a bit of extra capacity. Uh, I think that question has been asked before and typically um, Alberta Health Services has a representative available so they answer those specific questions. So uh, I know we've also been asked to have some of those statistics available. So maybe I can... So th that there's a way we can solve this. We, we've got somebody, uh, very capable communications folks from AHS uh, participating in this and from Alberta Health, I should say, perhaps they can get the answer and put it in the comments section below. But I can tell you that we've been briefed by Alberta Health Services as the Cabinet Emergency Committee that uh, they believe, based on our current projections about the velocity of the virus in Alberta, that we will have adequate equipment and supplies to cope with the peak uh, of the expected peak of the viral infection. Um, and I understand we have 50 additional ventilators that we or that AHS ordered in January when they first saw the uh, coronavirus uh, manifesting in China. Uh, we don't have those those ventilators yet. And I'll finally add that there are joint efforts across provinces and with the federal government uh, to see if we can can convert manufacturing facilities in the country to producing more ventilators. I think Alberta is in a better position than most provinces on a per person basis. Uh, and we're, uh, we were on a call this morning with all 10 premiers talking about joint efforts to um, uh, procure additional equipment here in Canada. Next question goes to Chantelle Lobb, who says, what are we doing for people who have to pay rent? I'll take that one, I guess, Chantelle. Uh, so, we, just yesterday we announced the new emergency payments for people who are in self-isolation. That will be about um, $1,100 uh, over two weeks. And you'll be able to go to alberta.ca uh, to apply for that. The, the money will be transferred through the My Alberta system. And it, it's only for people that do not have another form of income. Um, and let's be clear, this is if you have to self-isolate. People who are just choosing to stay at home but do not are not exhibiting relevant symptoms or who have tested negative or who have not traveled. In other words, people who just decided of their own volition to stay home are not eligible for those payments. This is for people who are following, following the public health protocols, Dr. Hinshaw's uh, guidelines, who must stay at home and they have to give up an income. That payment will be there. Let me say that we've also, I've reached out to some of the largest landlords uh, in the province asking if they would consider uh, some deferral on rent or some relaxation of, of rent payment uh, deadlines just to help people generally during this really difficult time. Uh, and I do want to appreciate the, um, the banks uh, that have followed the, the lead of Alberta Treasury branches in offering three-month deferrals on mortgage payments, both principal and interest, um, to again reflect the, uh, the financial anxiety people are feeling. Next question goes to Tiff Pino, who says, will you ever test people with symptoms who have not traveled or been in contact with someone diagnosed? So we're looking really closely at our testing right now. Uh, for about uh, almost two weeks now, we've been doing some additional testing in people who haven't traveled uh, as a part of our regular surveillance systems for influenza. And we've been really prioritizing. So for example, any outbreaks, if there's any individual in a long-term care facility who has an influenza-like illness, so fever, cough, uh, if we have outbreaks of any of those symptoms, we always test, this is part of our routine protocol every year, uh, but we're adding COVID to those and have been again for about a week. Uh, we're testing anyone who's hospitalized with any kind of fever, cough symptoms, uh, independent of whether or not they've traveled. And then we have certain, we call them sentinel physicians who are part of a network, and so they've been testing as well Again, they're part of our usual influenza surveillance system. And so we are doing some of that extra work to make sure that we're picking up mm -hmm. cases. Uh, what we are looking at is if we can potentially shift some of our capacity. Our lab is doing amazing work, uh, but even with that amazing work, we cannot test every Albertan with a cough or a sore throat. We simply cannot. So we are looking at how might we be able to shift some of that capacity and test a certain sample of people in the province who haven't traveled, uh, because we do want to get more information in addition to the samples that we're already running. Uh, but as you can imagine, it's just so a bit of a difficult thing. Those to would be like out. random sampling, so you have a better <clears throat> sense of, of 
how far the virus is spread? Is that what you mean? Well, we're, we're trying to determine what would make sense. So yeah. again, I think that what I would understand that question to be, I know I've heard concerns about people who say, you know, I have a cough, right. I haven't traveled, but I really want to get tested. And I called HealthLink and they said right. I couldn't because I didn't meet those criteria. And I'm not sure that we'll, we'll be able to open it up to the average sure. Albertan, but there may be certain groups of the population who we would test to help us um, understand that kind of spread. Again, yeah. uh, trying to figure out how do we use our scarce resources and in pandemic, we have a, an ethics framework that helps us work through when we do have scarce resources, how do we allocate those scarce resources in a way that takes into consideration people who are most vulnerable to severe disease, the effect on the population. And so we're working through that ethics framework to figure out how do we allocate this fixed number of lab tests for the population okay. to have the best benefit for the most people. Just to put this in context, folks, we, if, with a population of 4.3 million, we have at least hundreds of thousands of people who would have some kind of a flu during the course Absolutely. of the year. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're, only a, we're only able to, right now, turn around about 2,000 tests a day. But that number is the highest per capita number of tests happening pretty much in the whole world outside of two countries. Um, so we're testing at, at a very high rate but with hundreds of thousands of people who might have flu-like symptoms in a population of over four million, please understand that what Dr. Hinshaw is saying is we just cannot provide a test to everybody who, um, who may f have a cough, as she says. Mm -hmm. Next question goes to Rochelle Van Manen, who says, I'm wondering if there's additional recommendations for pregnant ladies. So we would recommend, uh, I would recommend somebody who's pregnant, again, similar recommendations to what I had before, so washing hands regularly, uh, making sure that uh, if you're out, you're staying as much as possible, about two meters away from people, especially those who have symptoms. Although ideally over time, uh, this new normal, as we've been talking about, would mean that there's less and less people with symptoms out in public. Uh, the early evidence from uh, the Chinese case series uh, didn't seem to indicate that women who were pregnant had more significant disease than others, but again, that's something that we need to get more data on. That was from their particular case series of about uh, 50,000 people. Uh, but certainly, it's always a good idea if, uh, when women are pregnant, to make sure that they're taking care of themselves, getting rest, making sure they have adequate nutrition. So all of those kinds of preventive things, but there really isn't anything specifically different for pregnant women than for others. All right, uh, thank you, doctor. Next question goes to Angela Sawula, who says, oops, uh, just one second. Uh, someone told me that public outdoor playgrounds were closed. Is this true? Can I take my kids to the local park? So my understanding is that in British Columbia, they have officially closed playgrounds. Um, in Alberta, we have closed indoor playgrounds. Uh, because so play places where kids can go and have um, slides and, and games so they can do. So all of those are closed, those indoor play places. I would say that it's really important for children to be outside, absolutely. What we're trying to avoid is having lots of children congregate together, especially, for example, with a play structure where there might be a lot of kids touching the same surfaces. And so while we haven't closed playgrounds, I would recommend, again, uh, thinking about things that your children can do outside, such as kicking a ball back and forth, uh, when it gets nicer, going for a bike ride, going for a walk, those kinds of things. But it really is important that we try to avoid having lots of kids all together because we're trying to avoid the possibility that there could be infection passed from one child to another. All right. Uh Next question, Donna uh, Feladichuk says, post-secondary campuses are still open, although classes have moved online. Is there any intent to close the campuses to the public? So what we chose to do in Alberta with the orders to close schools uh, and post-secondary institutions was to prohibit students from attending the, those um, sites, so those classes. And we, we worded it that way so that universities, post-secondary institutions, schools would be able to continue to offer educational opportunities to those students to be able to finish out the school year. With respect to closing campuses to the public, 
Uh, our concern would be certainly if there were gatherings, so gatherings of over 50 or gatherings that are even smaller than that, that would have people, critical uh, service workers, those who are more vulnerable to uh, poor outcomes from COVID, uh, or anyone who's coming from outside the country, there should be no gatherings of any size with those people. And so if we were seeing that universities became a gathering place, then we might need to consider additional measures. But at the current time, again, our, our intent was really to close down that in-person class environment to limit the number of people who are coming together in close quarters. All right, uh, so Caitlin Nothis asks, so if someone is sick with what we believe is a simple cough, should the whole house self-isolate? What if a spouse needs to work? Good question. Yeah, so, and again, I think this is something that going back to your comment about the impact on a household and finances uh, is really important. So if one person in the house has a cough or a sore throat, something minor, ideally, and I know that not everyone has this opportunity or luxury, but ideally, if it's at all possible, that one person who's sick should have a bedroom to themselves, ideally a bathroom to themselves, and not be around other family members uh, until they're feeling better, we are currently saying 14 days, which I know is a long time, but 14 days from the start of that symptom, cough, sore throat, uh, and as long as you're feeling better by then, that's the point that, that you can kind of go back and, and be in contact with your family again. So as long as it's just one person in the house who's sick and they are able to self-isolate in that way, then other people in the house, as long as they're well, as long as they're feeling fine, can continue their normal business. And, and folks, please under, look. Uh, I, I know Dr. Hinshaw agrees that um, financial security and, and economic security is, is part of the broader health perspective here as well. So, uh, we want people, if at all possible, to avoid losing both incomes. You know, this is uh, that can set people behind in their bills. So, if there's a way of structuring your, your affairs at home um, that that you can maintain at least that one income in, during these times. Uh, uh, people shouldn't feel badly about that. Uh, we, we had a minister whose wife just came back from the United States, so she's taken over the house and he's now bunking with a different MLA. So people are going to find different ways of, uh, of working through these things. Next, in, next question is to Jillian Somert, and she says, what's the plan for oil sands with flights and the amount of people going up north all the time? Is this a concern or are any precautions that the government is soon to put into place? So again, I would say that uh, we have been giving advice to any business. So any business that's operating anywhere in the province needs to do three things. The first thing they need to do is make sure that they're considering what measures they need to take to protect their employees in the workplace from potential exposure to COVID-19. The second thing they need to do is to consider what additional measures they may need to take for other people in the workplace. So depending on what that setting is, uh, there could be service to the public that's provided or it could be you know, co-workers together. So they need to think about what measures can they reasonably take to prevent spread within the workplace for whoever happens to be there. And the third thing that all businesses need to do is to think about business continuity, especially for essential services. And so with respect to flights up north and the concern about having people, and it was mentioned earlier, coming from different parts of Canada, those are things, again, that uh, that particular industry, again, we've, we've been uh, hearing some concerns about work camps, so we've been working on some information that, that's been made available to those businesses. Uh, but ultimately, those are the things that are the responsibility of all businesses, including that those particular industries in and, that area. And I would just add to that, Doctor, in saying that, that we believe, when we've identified with the federal government, that uh, those workplaces in the oil uh, sands are critical economic infrastructure, and that we all, uh, governments and the private sector, are working very closely together to make sure uh, of the, the health of the people who work in, on those sites. So we've reached out to the uh, oil sands producers, for example, and the camp operators uh, to offer extra information and, and, and particular help and a real focus on safety on those sites. And there's another, there's a related question coming from Chris Ritchie. He says, I heard that you want to shut down the energy sector. Is this true? Well, I can tell you for the government of Alberta, no, nothing could be further from the truth, doctor. Yeah, that's not my intention. Um, so we, let's be clear, we need the, the economy to continue to function, 
Uh, obviously, if you were to have a particular work site where there was an infection, then the health uh, care system, the AHS, would identify that person, trace who they were in contact with, but try to allow that, that work site to continue safely. Is that, is that a fair way of putting it? Absolutely. So, you know, what we've seen in other work settings where there has been a confirmed case and that contact tracing has identified close contacts, uh, often it's a business decision about whether or not they need to shut down a particular part of their operation uh, simply because there are so many of their employees in that environment who have been close contacts. And I think as this this uh, response to COVID-19 unfolds. And as you've said, Premier, it, it feels like it's been a lot longer than two weeks since we had our first case because so much has happened. But I think awareness is growing and I think more workplaces are realizing that they need to be very strict with employees, that they cannot come in to work while sick, even with mild symptoms, because the consequences of having spread within a closed environment is significant for businesses. So again, uh, the public health investigation is really focused on limiting the spread within those close contacts. And then public health works with businesses, employers to figure out uh, what kinds of additional measures that employer may need to take. Uh, but one of the requirements, again, is that anyone who's been a close contact does need to self-isolate. Right. So then the business needs to take those decisions about how they can operate within those restrictions. And on Chris's broader question, um, in fact, dealing with the collapse in energy prices and the global recession, we are working uh, over time to, to, to find every uh, practical solution to support the energy industry at this critical time. Yesterday I met uh, by phone with the board of the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers and uh, just stay tuned because we will be announcing additional measures uh, to support a future for our largest industry, our largest employers. Next question goes to uh, Norma Lovell, who's, or Lo Lowell, who says, uh, I heard, in Saskatchewan, I heard that healthcare workers just returned from abroad are being ordered back to work. I hope that they are uh, required to, se to self-isolate. So I can't speak to that from Saskatchewan. I'm not aware that that is happening in Saskatchewan. Uh, what I can say is that in Alberta, the requirement to self-isolate for two weeks after coming back from outside of Canada remains in place. And for certain healthcare workers, I will say that we've been working with Alberta Health Services to consider whether or not we might have exemptions for certain essential healthcare providers. So someone who maybe has returned from a trip is feeling completely well and if they're off for two weeks, a certain segment of healthcare delivery, because of specialized skills, expertise, a shortage of staff in that area, if, if, that, if their absence will mean that a certain segment of our healthcare system shuts down for two weeks, then we are weighing out those risks. And so working with Alberta Health Services to determine in exceptional circumstances, we may allow certain healthcare workers to work within that two week period as long as they have uh, symptom checks multiple times a day, they wear a mask continuously throughout that two-week period and follow other measures to make sure that any potential risk is mitigated, uh, again, only in exceptional circumstances, but weighing again uh, those risks and benefits of closing a particular section of healthcare down for two weeks against letting somebody who's completely well with those mitigating steps in place come back to work. Here's a question I've heard a few times from Brandon Rooks. He says, should there be an isolation period for those who are traveling within Canada? That's a really good question and certainly something that we're discussing in our special advisory committee, which is the chief medical officers of health from all across the country. And we're trying to determine whether or not, at what point might we have internal travel advisories within the country. We know that uh, some provinces are seeing some local spread uh, and, you know, I, I know that we've had several cases that have come back from a particular dental conference in Vancouver who've been determined to be cases. And so I think we're, what we're doing right now is we're really monitoring the situation. And so if there's a particular event like that dental conference or a particular area of another province where we see there might be significant local spread and significant risk, we may put those recommendations in place. Uh, and again, we're just monitoring the situation very closely and making sure that as we need to, if we need to update our recommendations, that we would do so. All right, Michelle Brandenburg asks, uh, how many ICU cases recover? I think she means 
uh, probably of how many people uh, diagnosed with COVID-19 who are put in ICU, how many of them recover? That is an excellent question. I don't have that statistic, the actual number offhand. Well, we certainly uh, don't have enough cases in Alberta to assess that. Yes, absolutely. We've only yeah. had two in ICU, correct? We've had three in three. ICU, and unfortunately one of those cases just uh, last night did pass away. Uh, so I'm trying to, to I've, I've seen the graph from, again, that World Health Organization report where they did show the graph of those who recover and those who go on to severe illness and in worst case scenarios, death. Uh, so certainly I would say that just because someone is in ICU doesn't mean that they automatically will die. Uh, they do have a higher risk of death, again, if they are in that critical category. Uh, but that might again be something that I ask my comms person to see if we could find that specific number for you and post it. And if we can't find that number, certainly we could post potentially the graphic from the um, World Health Organization report that sort of shows that proportion of cases that go from an initial presentation of either mild, serious or critical, and then over time go to complete recovery uh, or again in the unfortunate mm -hmm. cases to, to death. Doctor, what does the disease actually do? I mean, I, I think most people have heard that it creates kind of pneumonia-like conditions. Mm -hmm. Maybe for in, in, in layman's terms, what, could you explain what it does? Sure. How, how it hurts people? Yeah, so essentially the, the virus gets into the body and binds to the cells within the, the lining of, of the lungs. And then viruses are really interesting because they don't have the capacity themselves to reproduce. They have to use their host cells to reproduce. So a virus latches onto a cell, gets inside that cell, and then it uses that cell's mechanisms, biological mechanisms, to make copies of itself. And then that cell dies, those viruses spread out, and they attack other cells. So some of the some of the damage that's caused when someone is infected with this particular virus is actual uh, cell damage within the lining of, of the lungs and the, and the respiratory tract. But then what our body does is it mounts a response, an immune response. And so everyone's heard about you know, inflammation or inflammatory responses. And so there's a combination of the, the damage that the virus is actually doing in the lungs. And again, that's that pneumonia picture and that inflammation that's that's being caused as the body tries to fight against it. Uh, and, and if those inflammatory and the damage that's being caused by the virus is overwhelming the body's ability to uh, respond, then people can develop significant difficulty breathing. Uh, they can have, you know, as, as they get inflammation in the lungs, the lungs can't exchange oxygen mm -hmm. efficiently anymore. And so that's really the, those critical cases that go on to ICU are the cases where the body simply can't handle it, doesn't have the ability to exchange oxygen uh, and, and starts to kind of progress mm. into needing assistance with being intubated or ventilated. Uh, so it's kind of about that cell death and damage in the lungs. All right. Ryan Coley asks, uh, do you have enough medical supplies in Alberta? So again, you know, a couple of months ago when we saw this particular virus starting to spread in China, recognized that it was a new virus and had concerns that it could potentially spread, Alberta Health Services did look at their stockpiles. So part of preparing for a pandemic, and Premier, as you mentioned, this is something that public health does all the time. We have pandemic preparedness, we have plans, and part of that is actually maintaining a large stockpile of medical supplies should we need it, should we have this kind of surge demand. So Alberta Health Services looked at their inventories of supplies, uh, they ordered extra personal protective equipment at that time, again in January, realizing that there was potentially going to be a global demand for personal protective equipment. So they, they had stockpiles, they added to those stockpiles, and also looked at things like the, the kinds of supplies needed to care for a patient who's hospitalized. So really standard things like intravenous lines, uh, basic medications. And so again, uh, really lots of proactive work from Alberta Health Services to get some of those medications and supplies stockpiled and, and ready. So again, what I'm told by Alberta Health Services is they do have sufficient yeah. supply. And again, working with other provinces and territories in the federal government, to create supply chain plans yeah. so that if this goes on for a long time, we have the ability to work together to get additional supplies if and when those are needed. Right. Uh, so, I mean, the simple answer is, is 
yes, we believe we have enough supplies. Uh, and uh, now that's based on the modeling that, that Alberta Health Services is doing. And, and they, based on the aggressive measures that Dr. Hinshaw has recommended and that we have put in place, our belief is that the peak of infections will be below the maximum capacity of our healthcare system to handle it, and that we have enough equipment, both ventilators, personal protection equipment, and related medical supplies. Um, but we'll have to take, we can't take any of that for granted. And uh, that's why we're working with other provinces and the federal government on potentially sourcing other stuff. It may mean, may mean uh, converting factories in Canada to produce additional uh, personal protection equipment and ventilators, in part because we just don't know how long this will carry on. But we do believe right now that we have enough supplies. That's the simple, mm -hmm. I think, simple answer to that question. Mandy Fisher asks, have patients of the dentist in the south zone been contacted? Should we be concerned if we had a recent dentist appointment? So uh, what Alberta Health Services the, is the organization, as everyone knows, who, who does frontline service delivery, which includes public health. And so with respect to this particular question, um, I don't personally know of an exposure in a dentist's office in South Zone, but what I do know is that whenever there's a confirmed case, Alberta Health Services and their local public health teams make sure to get a detailed history of where that person was while they experienced symptoms and then anyone who they were in close contact with during that time that they were symptomatic is contacted directly one-on-one -on -one, and Alberta Health Services Public Health follows up with them to make sure that they understand that they were a contact and that they need to stay at home self-isolate for 14 days. So uh, typically again it can take sometimes a couple of days for Alberta Health Services to finish those investigations uh, but they do individually contact anyone who's deemed to be at risk so someone who had a dentist appointment and wasn't contacted uh, does not need to worry. All right, uh, Dylan Fermanyuk asks, are the highways going to be closed or will movement be restricted in any way? And I, I think I can take that in saying no. Uh, I, look, the government has extraordinary powers uh, that uh, it could use in a much more serious public emergency, but there's no intention. We don't see really any rationale to stop movement or close the highways or roads. Correct. Yeah. There would be, I, we, I see no connection to that and the uh, pandemic situation that we're, we're going through. In fact, to the contrary, I, folks, I keep trying to make this point. We've, we've got to continue to try to carry on uh, living normal lives to the greatest extent possible while being very mindful of the uh, advice and guidelines from uh, Alberta Health Services and, and the Chief Medical Officer. The main advice there is if you're feeling sick, please stay at home uh, and all of the other stuff. Why don't you go through that? The washing hands, go through all of it. <laughs> so as you said, uh, first and foremost, if you're feeling sick at all, even if it's mild, even if it's minor, stay home and away from others. That is critical. The other pieces, so there's, there's things you can do to protect others, that would be one of them. In addition, uh, if you do cough or sneeze while you're around other people, making sure that you're coughing or sneezing into your elbow, uh, covering your mouth with a, a tissue if you have one, and making sure to wash your hands immediately afterwards, disposing of your tissue in the garbage. Uh, so those are how you protect others. Then protecting yourself would be washing your hands re regularly, not touching your face, your eyes with unwashed hands and making sure that if you are out, you're trying to stay about two meters away from people, especially if there are people who are looking like they're ill. Uh, but really, again, at this time, we're recommending as much as possible trying to use that social distancing. So if you're waiting in line for a coffee, which is totally fine, just try and stay at a distance from the other people in line. But please hear both parts of that. You can go for a coffee. I stopped by a coffee shop earlier today, and uh, typical Canadians, Everybody standing patiently in queue, all like uh, about a meter apart from one another. Love how people are responding to things like that. And by the way, the panic buying, not happy with that. That is that is kind of disappointing. That's not the Alberta spirit. But Dylan, absolutely no reason for us to close the roads. To the contrary, you know, let me just be honest. We, we, the only way we can keep filling those grocery stores is if our trucks keep coming and going. And by the way, we need those truckers to be able to drop by in coffee shops and uh, maybe get a get a, a sandwich on the road. So normal life has to carry on as long as we're all mindful of the uh, health guidelines that doctor just summarized. All right, Jennifer Monch says, I hope I didn't mispronounce your name, Jennifer, says, what support do you plan for business owners? Well, I, I'll take that one. Um, 
First of all, we worked with Alberta Treasury branches and we're working with the credit unions that are regulated by the province to provide for greater flexibility on loan repayments. So ATB, if you apply to ATB or the credit unions, they uh, will uh, try to provide at least three months of a um, pay, an opportunity not to pay uh, on your loan. They'll, they'll provide greater a greater period of um, uh, flexibility for, for loans and mortgages. That is also true of the major chartered banks. Uh, secondly, um, we have put in place a three-month deferral, actually no, excuse me, a six-month deferral on business taxes, on corporate income taxes. That matches something the federal government did yesterday. Thirdly, we are considering, but haven't yet landed on, a deferral on workers' compensation board premiums. We're also looking at a potential deferral on the um, non-residential property taxes. So we're doing, we're looking at, at every fee and, and charge that the provincial and tax that provincial government imposes on businesses and seeing which ones we can defer. There might be some where there are rebates um, and uh, there will be additional measures that we'll announce in the days to come. Paul Fiegler says, will there be any changes for those of us on WCB? No, if you're receiving workers' compensation board premiums, Paul, uh, you will continue to do so. Um, when I just mentioned WCB premiums, I'm talking about the employer premiums. We're looking at possibly some relaxation of the payment of those just because so many businesses have no revenue right now. All right, Brad Michael says, what's being done or can be done to protect seniors' mental health given the prudent and necessary steps taken at senior centers? That, that's a great question, Doctor. Absolutely, and we know that isolation is a significant health risk. And so as we've been restricting visitors in long-term care and continuing care, uh, one of the consequences of that could certainly be that seniors are, well, absolutely will be that they are more isolated, particularly from that in-person interaction. So while I know that uh, in, in certain centers where seniors have complex needs and perhaps have cognitive impairment, some of the more remote options might be challenging, uh, but we're really encouraging our long-term care and continuing care providers to think about ways that they can work with families and loved ones of those seniors in their care, to think about creative ways that they can support those loved ones, whether it is a video call, a recorded message, perhaps someone playing the piano or singing a song for that person and sending a an audio recording of that to someone who can That's play it idea. for that senior. So I think there, there are lots of different things that people can do, recognizing that, that there will be a gap and people will feel that uh, isolation because we all need in-person contact. Uh, but again, these are our most frail and vulnerable uh, population living in these long-term care facilities. And so it is a priority to protect them from the spread of this virus. Uh, next question goes to uh, Melanie Hengen Seeley, who says, uh, what is going to happen with diploma exams? There are large numbers of kids in one area for a period of time. I think those are two different issues, but Melanie, on the d diploma exams, uh, the government is working with post-secondary institutions to ensure that these, actually, I'll, I think you're asking about uh, probably K-12, to so I'll go there. Every K-12 to student will receive a final mark and students will progress to their next grade level next year. Provincial assessments such as provincial achievement tests will be cancelled. At this time diploma exams essential for post-secondary acceptance will continue. Every student who is eligible to graduate uh, from grade 12 this year <coughs> I try to follow your protocol there doctor. Excellent. <laughs> Every um, student who is eligible to graduate from grade 12 this year will graduate. So if you're looking for more information on that, uh, Melanie, please visit the website of the Department of Education and I'd ask our team to please put a link on that below. Uh, and don't worry folks, I, I think, I'm pretty sure my health is okay. I, it's been a pretty stressful week, but yes. we'll get through it. Uh, Tifa Assad says, why, and by the way, Dr. Hinshaw had some I think cold symptoms recently. Are you, how are you feeling? Are you, are you I'm feeling fine. I had a sore throat on Monday morning and so uh, I, it is very important to me to act with integrity and I had a sore throat so even though my symptoms weren't obvious it was important to me to stay home as I've told others to do and so at that time um, I believe Premier as you know there was some discussion within 
uh, you know, my senior leadership about the pros and cons of considering requesting a test for me. Uh, I do recognize that there's many Albertans who would like to have that, so I apologize to those. So no, no, however. no, 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 she's been way too Canadian about this, apologizing <laughs> for no. So we insisted that the doctor take the test and get results quickly. We can't afford for her to be sidelined. So uh, we're glad we glad that worked out and you, you tested negative. Yes. Uh, Tifa Assad says, why are hospitals and senior care facilities not allowing this healthcare staff to wear masks? So uh, I'm not sure what context, so I guess that that would be a question that um, would be helpful to know more context. I understand that this is a difficult to, to get that additional detail. I think that this may be a question about why workers aren't allowed to wear masks all the time. Uh, and so if that's, if that's the question, um, then I think the, the answer would be that masks are absolutely critically important when caring for patients who have symptoms of any kind, you know, cough, fever. And so in that setting, I would be quite surprised if healthcare workers or staff were not allowed to wear masks. So again, my assumption is that this might be about workers who may wish to wear masks at all times. And so again, that goes back to making sure that we're using prudent and appropriate use of our resources. We do have a lot of stock of personal protective equipment and we need to use it in a prudent way. We know that across the world, I'm sure anyone who's watching the news knows that many, many countries in the world are experiencing significant challenges with COVID-19. And so we can't take our supplies for granted. We need to use them when they're appropriate, when they're needed to protect people's health. Uh, but if workers are caring for patients who have no respiratory symptoms, uh, who are not uh, at risk for that, then it would not be appropriate for them to use personal protective equipment that isn't necessary. And uh, we believe the province does have adequate stocks of personal protection equipment for healthcare workers uh, in the AHS inventory, but uh, it's not unlimited. And please understand folks that we've got to plan for the peak of this uh, pandemic. And we also have to plan for a kind of bad case scenario. So there does have to be some reasonable limitation on how much of that equipment is, is distributed. All right, uh, Chris Meninguit says, uh, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing any names, folks. Will there be a mandatory no hoarding rule in stores or a limit of items for purchases? So I'll take that on. Uh, the answer is the province has no intention of imposing such limits, uh, but some stores have decided to do so themselves. I understand that they put in a limit to how much a pro one product a customer can buy in a given day. And we really want to commend those retailers who have brought in special dedicated golden hours for seniors in particular, usually early in the morning. And uh, we're seniors uh, who are the most susceptible to this virus and who are less capable of, or less able to cope with hyper aggressive shopping. They can come in early in the morning in many stores to a fully stocked and clean store. Um, and we just want to thank those retail. Tomorrow I'm going to be visiting one of those retailers at 7 a.m. just to thank them as a good example. But I want to repeat, folks, there is no reason for hoarding. It's just dumb. It is unnecessary. You should have enough food and key supplies in your home for to last you for about a couple of weeks, because who knows, you might have to isolate yourself if you're not feeling well. But there is absolutely no reason to go beyond that and, and to stockpile stuff. Um, please be considerate of, of your fellow Albertans at this challenging time. Uh, we'll just take a couple of more questions because we've been at this for about an hour. Becca Daly asks, are workers allowed to refuse work and self-isolate if there's potential exposure at their work site? So uh, I, I'm not familiar with the workplace health and safety legislation in great detail. So there would be more detail available, uh, likely on Ministry of Labor site or, or from those sources. Uh, so I, won't, I can't really comment on the legislative aspect of that. Uh, but what I would say is that there's really important for workers to be able to do a point of care risk assessment. So wherever a, a worker is engaged in, in that particular work that they're doing, whether it's engaging with people or doing any kind of activity, uh, the worker needs to be empowered to do that point of care risk assessment and then take precautions that are necessary. 
Uh, and so it's important and again we've been working with uh, health services for sure to make sure that it's really clear what the recommendations are for what kinds of personal protective equipment are required if somebody is potentially going to be in contact with someone uh, who has respiratory symptoms and so th those are the kinds of things that, that we've been doing from the health side to make sure that those recommendations are clear. And again, it's up to the employer uh, to be supporting the worker in those point of care risk assessments. Uh, but again, I would recommend the Ministry of Labour's website for the specific legislative outlines and in what's required. So we'll take just a couple more questions uh, because I know both, both Dr. Hinshaw and I have to get back to work. Uh, well, this is work, I guess, but we've got a lot of other things to do as well. Motion Shams asks, I wanted to go and donate blood, but I'm very concerned about the environment due to COVID-19. Should I go for blood donation or not? Good question. It's an excellent question, and we've actually seen blood donation drop off, probably because of some of those concerns. People who are worried about uh, being out in this time when there's lots of anxiety. What I can tell you is that Canadian Blood Services is taking the situation extremely seriously and making sure that in their process for donating blood, uh, people are kept at a distance from each other, that there's adequate hand washing. Uh, if you're feeling ill at all, then absolutely you should stay home and not go out. If you're feeling well, uh, and you can go to donate blood safely, again this is an important thing to do because people continue to have other illnesses even though COVID-19 is spreading and the blood supply yeah. actually is a, a critical concern at this point in time. So I really would encourage Albertans who are eligible to donate and who are feeling well, please do go and donate because you can save lives through doing that as well. All right, Matt Warman asks, will the COVID crisis impact the provincial budget? Yes, Matt, it will impact the budget very significantly. Uh, we, The legislature passed our budget for the upcoming fiscal year 2020, 2021. We did so on uh, Monday night, I believe, uh, Tuesday night, everything's a blur to me. It was this week uh, on a fast track basis, to be honest, because we're concerned uh, that the legislature might be hit by the virus. So we needed to get that done. Uh, that provides $57 billion of funding, including a $21.1 billion in funding for Alberta Health Services. We added an additional half a billion dollars uh, for the immediate response to the pandemic. But as I said, we will spare no expense, and I fully anticipate we'll have to allocate additional funds through what are called supplementary estimates. But the broader effect will be through the economy because COVID-19 has created a global recession. It started in China, it kind of followed the direction of the virus. And, and, and now with so many economies that are largely impaired or shut down, the impact is profound. Um, yesterday, JP Morgan, a major firm, projected that the United States economy will shrink by 14% in the second quarter of this year and that the European economy will shrink by 30% uh, next year, this upcoming quarter, second quarter. And, and let me be blunt with you, I believe that the Alberta economy is, is likely to shrink by at least that much, which is shocking. I, I must tell you, when I first saw that and internalized that, I was, I was quite emotional because uh, of we all need to understand what the human and social impact of that will be. Um, and I think that is likely to be deeper in Alberta because this is happening at the same time as this collapse in global oil prices, which was in part created by COVID. What happened was demand went down in China, including demand for energy. So energy prices went down with shrinking demand. Now, normally what would happen in a normal world, a normally functioning market environment is that supply would go down with the demand and, and energy producers like OPEC and Russia would reduce supply, but they did the opposite because they're in a fight with each other uh, over market share and they want to suppress energy production in North America, in the United States and Canada. So the Saudis and OPEC are, and Russians are surging oil supply in the face of diminishing demand, the first time those two things have happened concurrently since 1930. As a result of which, global energy prices have collapsed. We've gone from, uh, w the, the standard benchmark for our energy is called WTI, West Texas Intermediate, went from 60, roughly $63 average in January to about $19 now. So it's fallen by two thirds. And um, we expect it may very well fall further. Uh, Western Canada Select, which is the main Canadian product price, 
has gone down as it was trading as low as six dollars today so um, folks I just owe it to you to be a, a very direct about this we want to hope for the best and we will do everything we can to protect families financial security and our economy so we have the ability to to fund things like our, our, our great health care system but we are in for some very challenging times and that the question was about the deficit yes it will be very severely affected uh, I f expect that in uh, the deficit will at, l at least double from what we were expecting the upcoming year uh, we, we had planned on a deficit of a little under $7 billion. I expect just based on the massive decline in revenue that we see, that will likely double from there. And then in addition, our government will have to uh, provide emergency funding to, to, to families, liquid, to help, help businesses get through this, this super tough time, but also uh, some stimulus when we get past the pandemic to try to get people back to work and that's going to cost extra money. So this is not just a public health uh, crisis, it is also quite frankly an economic crisis and we we appreciate the Government of Canada's announcement yesterday. We're going to need a lot more help and I one thing I can assure you, I was on a call with all Premiers today and they all Canadians stand behind us. They understand this time of unique adversity in Alberta. Newfoundland is facing it as well and I believe we have the solidarity of our fellow Canadians. So with that, folks, the doctor and I have been at this for over an hour. Let me once again thank Dr. Dina Hinshaw, Chief Medical Officer of Health for Alberta, for her tremendous work in being a, 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 an expert, steady hand uh, during this super challenging time. Um, and I just want to end, I, I talked about the big economic challenges we're facing. I want to end on, on a note of, of hopefulness that, that we, as I said in the legislature yesterday, uh, we Albertans have been through the people who built this province have been through some even more challenging times. The Spanish flu in 1918, just after the Great War, um, you know, the, the, the Great Depression and the Second World War. We're resilient people. Uh, we have each other. We have strong institutions. We have one of the best health systems in the world. And we will get through this challenging time. So please follow Dr. Hinshaw's advice. Uh, keep in touch. Uh, look out for people who who need help, be aware of your neighbors, who, especially this, the elderly and frail who might be in self-isolation. The best way for us to defeat this challenging, uh, the public health challenge, is obviously uh, follow the basic um, rules for personal hygiene uh, and, and, and social distancing, but don't distance yourselves completely from those who need help. The best way we can get through this together Work, volunteer with a charity or nonprofit, Meals on Wheels, or um, uh, you know other charities that are going to be helping folks in self isolation. They need they need to have uh, pharmaceuticals delivered to them, sometimes food delivered to them. Look out for others. Don't engage in hoard shopping. Instead, if you live next next to a senior, just go next door and knock on their door and see if they need groceries delivered to them. That's the best kind of thing that we can do as individuals and collectively to get through this together. Uh, Alberta Strong. So thank you very much, Doctor, for all that you're doing and uh, we truly appreciate it.